Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. including a child have been massacred in Colombia. Their bodies were discovered in the rural area of Mipiripan in an abandoned house. They were facing down and appeared to be victims of a firing squad. The area was the scene of a massacre in the 1997 when paramilitaries tortured and killed dozens of people. Our correspondent, Tatiana Portela, has the details. Unfortunately, we have to bring you this news. On Monday, around 5 o'clock in the evening, six people, including a minor, were murdered in the Department of Meta. Information was provided by an army commander who told the media that at 5 p.m., heavily armed men arrived to the location and murdered these people. The Colombian army commander also said that this act involved dissidents of the FARC. But what residents of this region have said is that this is an area precisely in the San Luis y la Realidad where there is a strong presence of paramilitary groups. The attorney general's office has confirmed that it will be heading to the location of the murders to determine what took place there. Meanwhile, human rights organizations are headed there to speak with residents and to find out who was behind these murders. We have to remember that it was here in 1997 that one of the worst massacres in Colombia took place and was carried out by paramilitaries with the support of the military. And the National University of Colombia has condemned the massacre. Yesterday, we were killed six people in the municipality of Mapiripan, and this reminds us of one of the darkest facts in the history of the country 11 years ago, in 1997. The paramilitaries made a massacre and killed 2,000 people in the same region. There is a very complex situation dominated by illegal economic activities and the presence of neo-paramilitarism groups and the self-defenses in the region called Los Puntilleros who are the ones who make the presence where this massacre is perpetrated. The government has finally abandoned, or at least, it has not been its central of action. Their so-called policy of substitution of cultivation, but its anti-drug policy is returning to the most repressive and militaristic elements of the Uribe era and what we see with this massacre is the failure of the anti-drug policy. And President Ivan Duque said that the army will not stop fighting the ELN even after the armed group announced a truce. The National Liberation Army said on Monday they will have a ceasefire for Christmas which begins on December 23rd until the 3rd of January. They called the government to end the military attacks and to restart peace negotiations. Duque called off the peace talks when he took office earlier this year. Even with a negative declaration from the government, the ELN... Despite these actions by the government and the army, the Senate's Peace Commission in Colombia has asked both sides to reconsider their stance in a bid to resolve the grave humanitarian crisis in the country. The ELN recently announced a temporary ceasefire that will start on December 23rd and last until January 3rd. Many see these decisions as a major step on the side of the armed group. Our organization supports this announcement. This ceasefire will be short, only lasting 11 days, but these days must be used to have a meeting and restart talks between the government and the ELN. Despite the announcement by the ELN and hope for the government to restart negotiation, President Ivan Duque shut down this opportunity. I think that a clear message has to be sent to those who continue acting violently. We talk about peace while they are still performing violent acts. The only way in which there can be true peace is with the release of all kidnapped people and an end to all criminal activities.
Members of the Peace Commission have pointed out that the ELN's announcement has to be seen as a humanitarian gesture to build confidence between both sides and to resume talks that have been frozen for five months. We have to acknowledge this gesture. Amidst a scene where there was no answer, the ELN is taking an important step, despite it being for a short time. I believe that the answer from the government should be to find ways to strengthen this decision and not to take it as an irrelevant gesture. We have to figure out all the steps that would reactivate talks, and we are going to insist. We'll keep looking for ways despite working with a government that seems unwilling to move forward. Even with a negative declaration from the government, the ELN has announced its commitment for complete peace continues and they are not giving up on talks. Meanwhile, the Peace Commission will continue to look for mechanisms so that the government fulfills their duty with the Colombian people. And this December 18th marks the anniversary of the first victory of Bolivian President Evo Morales 13 years ago. With 54% of votes, the Movement for Socialism won the election and he became the first indigenous president of the country. Coming from the Aymara community, Morales was a union leader and activist. In this decade, Bolivia has cut poverty almost to 40% and registers the fifth largest economic growth in Latin America. And Morales now is set to run for office once again. Today we begin to defeat the economic looting, the plundering of our natural resources. Thanks to the unity of the Bolivian people, we defeated the policies of discrimination. Thanks to the unity of the Bolivian people. And in Ecuador, the government of Lenin Moreno has announced a number of economic, new economic measures. In a press conference, the government announced that it will be slashing subsides for gas this means that extra will now cost $1.85 from $1.48. Meanwhile, the Minister of Work, Raul Ledesma, also announced that the government will reduce the salary of public workers by 5% and will be eliminating 25,000 vacant positions in order to cut public spending. In Guatemala, two activists have been killed in the region of Isquisis, the brothers Neri Esteban Pedro and Domingo Esteban Pedro were part of a group protesting the construction of a hydroelectric plant in the region. The activists were shot dead and another person was injured in the attack. Time for a break here in From the South, but make sure to follow us on Twitter at Telesur English and my personal account at Laura P. Telesur. Stay with us. And the 53rd semi-annual summit of the South American trade bloc, Mercosur, has been marked with the new Argentine presidency, Mateo Grille from Montevideo, has more details. 
The temporary presidency of Mercosur has already been assumed by Argentina. It's now up to Argentine President Mauricio Macri to lead the economic integration of the Southern Bloc. Macri has said there's need to open to the war with the free trade agreement between Europe, Asia and Mercosur. Additionally, for Bolsonaro, Mercosur doesn't seem to be his priority. Therefore, several countries of the bloc have been concerned. So we will have to wait and see what is unfold in the upcoming months. And dozens of people in the city of Los Angeles have held a vigil for seven-year-old Jacqueline Cal. The young Venezuelan girl who died over a week ago due to dehydration and exhaustion. She had crossed the Mexico-U.S. border with her father, but they were instantly detained by U.S. border patrol agents. She reportedly developed fever and suffered a cardiac arrest at a hospital in Texas. The U.S. is being widely criticized for its handling of migrants from from make Central American countries. I'm taking office. The U.S. has a history in militarized borders. The U.S. has a history of imperialism and intervention in South America, in Central America, in Mexico, and in many countries around, around the world. Um, people find refuge in the U.S. However, there is no American dream here in the U.S. Um, I think when a lot of immigrant communities, specifically indigenous communities, come to the U.S., they face many layers of racism and discrimination. I think that cities across the U.S. ought to be holding vigils on behalf of this little girl and demanding answers as to why did she die? Uh, why did they not give her the medical treatment that she needed? Why did they put her on a bus uh, in, for two hours? hours uh, before they actually reached uh, help. Uh, why did they not believe her father when he told them that she was vomiting and she was running a high fever? These are all questions that we all want. We want to report. We want more transparency out of Border Patrol. And the United Nations is celebrating International Migrants Day. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said migration is a powerful driver of economic growth and dynamism and understanding. He also explained that migration allows millions of people to find new life opportunities and be of benefits their new and old communities. According to the International Organization for Migration, it is estimated that currently there are 244 million migrants globally, accounting for almost 4% of the global population. And protests were also held in Washington, D.C. to demand justice for Jacqueline, while her family in Guatemala is asking for a transparent and neutral investigation into her death. In front of the Customs and Borders offices, they are demanding justice for Jacqueline. You know, it's a crime. We are, ca we are causing the, the, the deaths of these people. And one of our signs says, ta U.S. taxes pay for all of this. So we're all responsible as taxpayers for what happened to Jacqueline and the many, many other people whose names we heard today who have died on the border trying to get protection here in the United States. In the custody of the border agents, Jacqueline, a Guatemalan girl of just seven years, died after suffering from septic shock. She had been detained along with her father after crossing the border. The events have caused widespread outrage. This system, this type of politics, they're unjust, inhuman. And we're here to say that there should be no further investment on the border, no more investment against migration or ICE, nothing more for deportations and nothing more for that wall. There have been protests in many cities. However, the tragedy of young migrants is far from coming to a conclusion. In the United States, there are more than 15,000 minors who find themselves in the border custody. In the largest of these camps, in Tornillo, Texas, more than 2,800 are held. Uh, we've gone from hundreds to now thousands of children, uh, kids who've been here for days, who now have been here for months, uh, almost half a year. Uh, in, in some cases. And even though members of Congress will visit the detention center where Jacqueline was incarcerated before her death, the United States migratory policies of Donald Trump don't look close to ending. The threat of paralyzing the government if five billion U.S. dollars aren't budgeted for the construction of a border wall continues to show the priorities of the administration. 
And in Argentina, the Supreme Court has ruled the government of Mauricio Macri to be acting against the Constitution for fixing retirement ages. The Supreme Court has asked Congress to hold the ASPIC index under which retirees are entitled to an increase of their pension. The government says that the decision is, not, is a blow to its financial plans. Thousands of pensioners gather outside the Supreme Court of Justice to hear the ruling. Following the news, retirees pointed out that the decision was in favor of the working people. Today was a small through. It doesn't change much, but if I think it begins to tilt it the popular balance, recognizing all the lies that has been making this government since the beginning. Our correspondent Edgardo Esteban explains. Some good news have been delivered to pensioners in Argentina this holiday season. The Supreme Court has ordered the government to pay a significant amount of funds to well over 100,000 retirees. The courts ruled that the government has not been using the right index to update pension payments, so it has ordered that a new system is applied, which actually increases monthly payouts. The court ruling came after a lawsuit filed six years ago by a pensioner, who demanded that increases to his pension payments are calculated through an index that uses the minimum wage set for construction workers as reference. A court of appeals had previously ruled in the pensioner's favor. Now with four votes in favor and one against, the Supreme Court upheld that appeals court ruling. With the previous index, pensions were roughly 60% lower. With this latest ruling, the court sets an automatic precedent for thousands of similar cases already before the Supreme Court awaiting for a ruling. There are many more pending cases, much like this one, before the courts. This means that the government will have to pay out much more. Also in Argentina, social movements are demonstrating against the government's use of force against peaceful protesters. I'm part of the picketing force which has mobilized protesters after the minister catalogued us as extortionists. Today we are protesting for the recovery of all social plans that have been eliminated. We want an increase to 6,000 pesos for all subsidies. This is the strategy of a collapsed government even with the help of the IMF. The repressive tactics are of a desperate government. And in Brazil, a massive fire in the Amazon region has destroyed around 600 wooden houses, but caused no death. The fire started in the city of Manaus on Monday and was extinguished by more than 100 firefighters. Four people were taken to hospital for smoke inhalation, and it was most likely caused by a pressure cooker, cooker left on a stove. The, rebel, the fire rapidly destroyed an improvised district of the city. Port workers' month-long strike in Chile's key port of Valparaíso has spread to other ports along the Pacific coast. Chilean police reportedly raided union office on Monday evening. Workers started the strike in mid-November demanding better contracts, improved working conditions and a bonus. Valparaíso's port handles about 55% of Chile's food exports and the strike has caused massive shipment delays. And a Peruvian judge has postponed the hearing of Alberto Fujimori for the Barrios Altos massacre in 1991. Following a three-hour hearing, magistrates of the Special Criminal Court failed to make a decision on granting a pardon instead an extend an extend and an extension has been given to so that Fujimori defense lawyer can prepare a stronger case. Fujimori stands accused of banking, banking a state massacre of 15 people and is being investigated for the death of nine students and a teacher in the La Catunta massacre. Time for a second break. More news when we are back.
为了保持身体健康，我冥想。Para mantenerme saludable, yo corro. To keep myself healthy, I study. Για να διατηρηθώ υγιής, τρέφω με σωστά. Para mantenerme saludable, yo bailo. Para mantenerme saludable, yo purifico mi espíritu a través del cuerpo. ¿Y tú? Guide your body. Tuesdays, only on Telesur. Back. The Arab League have held an emergency meeting in Egypt to discuss the possibility of Brazil moving its embassy to Jerusalem. The meeting was requested by the Palestinian leadership as Brazil President-elect Jair Bolsonaro has recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Bolsonaro is set to take office in January and is expected to keep his promise of moving Brazil's embassy to Jerusalem following in the footsteps of the United States. The Kuwaiti representative said the move would constitute a clear violation of Palestinian sovereignty. The transfer of diplomatic missions to Jerusalem means a clear violation of the resolution of the Security Council, especially of the resolutions 476 and 478. And the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and the King of Jordan Abdullah II have agreed there is a need to support the Palestinian Authority. Abbas is visiting Jordan and met with the King, who reaffirmed his rejection of Israel's unilateral policies. Abbas is on a regional tour in a bid to mobilize more support for his people in the face of an increasing Israeli aggression. In the recent weeks, Israel has intensified its violence incursions into Palestine. And the UN Special Envoy of the Secretary General for Yemen, Martin Griffith, have responded to the ceasefire in Yemen's Hodeida port. He said that although ceasefires are no, not known for, to work, this one is working so far. And representatives from Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Turkey have met in Geneva to discuss the establishment of a Syrian Constitutional Committee. They have agreed to hold the first meeting of the committee at the start of next year. The decision to draw a new Syrian constitution was agreed in January at the Russian city of Sochi. It was agreed to make efforts to convene the first session of the Constitutional Committee in Geneva early next year. We also expressed their conviction that these steps will lead to the launch of viable and lasting political process led by Syria and facilitated by the UN, in line with the decisions of the Syrian National Dialogue Congress in Sochi and the resolution of the UN Security Council. And the UN Special Envoy to Syria, Stephen Mistura, assured that all efforts are being made to ensure the Syrian constitution will be credible and inclusive. The three foreign ministers offered to me a significant joint input, input regarding the Constitutional Committee. In close consultation with the Secretary General, I believe that there is a extra mile to go, an extra mile to go. At the end of the meeting, the UN Special Envoy Staffen Mistura remarked that he will be presenting a report to the United Nations Security Council on December 20th. 
and the Spanish Supreme Court has held its first hearing before the trial of 18 Catalan independence leaders accused of sedition. Our correspondent in Madrid, Edu Marin, has the details. The pre-trial hearing for the leaders of the Catalan independence movement has lasted for a little longer than four hours. For the first time, the seven judges of the Supreme Court have listened to the arguments of both the prosecution and the defence as to whether the court is the appropriate venue for judging the independence movement. The defence has said that the Supreme Court does not have the right to hear the case as the alleged crimes were committed in Catalonia. It added that the court is acting under political duress. However, the prosecution claims that the court should hear the case because even though the alleged crimes were committed in Catalonia, they affected the whole country. None of the 18 accused were present at the hearing. Some are living in exile and others are in jail. The resolution will be released in the coming hours. The court will decide whether it has the authority to judge the independence process or not. If they conclude that they have that authority, the Supreme Court will also set a date for the trial. And Donald Trump's former security advisor, Michael Flynn, has appeared in court this Tuesday for having lied to the FBI. The president judge has postponed the sentencing to give Flynn more time to cooperate with the Mueller investigation into collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign in 2016. The former general pledged guilty to the charges in 2017. The sentencing was, has been rescheduled for March 13th. And the French coach Corinne Diac is hoping to guide Le Bleu then to the next Women's World Cup title. But she has another job in fighting discrimination. Diacre says women in football face a constant struggle for acceptance and are often regarded as objects for the French coach, ri coach rising visibility and gather media coverage of female players is the key to pushing the female version of this sport. Like this, we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find more on our website, telesorienglish.net, where, of course, you can read and watch our opinion articles and special interviews. Continue with Telesur. Until next time.